Coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, this is the award-winning Parareality Radio. My name's Sandman, and I'm your host. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Well, you know, it's Friday, Cinco de Mayo, May the 5th, 2017. And, of course, you know that means that it's time for another episode of your favorite podcast, Parareality Radio. I've got a great one in store for you tonight. I'm really excited to introduce my guest and and there's my creepy clock going off in the background. It always goes off every podcast. Can't have a podcast without it. So there it is, everybody. Just get it out of the way at first, right? So talking over my clock here. All right, so media is a powerful thing. It comes in all forms. It's written down in books, magazines, newspapers, and online publications. It comes in music in all forms. It comes in spoken word such as this podcast, and even comes in the visual arts, such as our television shows, news reports, and even in big-budget movies. Media has been used to communicate all kinds of things down through the millennia. It's been used by the church to propagate its religious propaganda. It's been used by the government to get us into false wars that we had no business being in. And most recently, it was used by our television news stations to try to sway the U.S. presidential election. But the church, the government, and the news aren't the only people who have successfully used media in all its forms to manipulate the minds of millions of people around the world. That mysterious, nefarious group that stays hidden in the shadows, manipulating the world like a puppet on a string, the Illuminati, has been using media for hundreds of years in an attempt to gain complete control of the world's population. And it seems to be working. The Illuminati have infiltrated every aspect of media, books, television, music, and even our movies using these things to their advantage, controlling our minds, warping our sense of right and wrong, and driving us to submit to their will all without us ever even realizing that that's what's happening. However, there's one man who sees behind the veil of evil that the Illuminati hides behind, and he's on a, on a mission to expose them for what they are and to wake up our sleeping human minds to their devious plans. His name is Isaac Weishaupt, also known as the Illuminati Watcher, He's the author of such books as A Grand Unified Conspiracy Theory, Sacrifice, Magic Behind the Mic, and Kubrick's Code, and several other books. His latest is called The Star Wars Conspiracy, Hidden Occult and Illuminati Symbolism of Aliens in the New Age. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce you to the Illuminati Watcher himself, Isaac Weishaupt. Welcome to Pair Reality Radio, Isaac. Hey, Sam, man. Thanks for having me back on. I uh, appreciate your your warm welcome. I feel like I am the superhero, the Illuminati watcher. <laughs> you <laughs> no, are. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, that's what you're saying is dead on. I, I, I try to sort of peer into the abyss and look at the darkness of the occult and pull out relevant symbolism that we find in our common everyday entertainment and media because like you alluded to i believe that they've buried certain messages themes symbolism in films and music uh, etc in order to sort of be absorbed by the viewer and build up inside of the subconscious and we can go into all the ideas of why they do that in the show obviously but yeah uh, yeah thanks for having me back on i also wanted to tell you i think your i think your clock should be your intro man it's kind of like uh walking into a haunted house from those old hammer horror films it <laughs> so is it's kind of fitting that's why i keep it around because it's, it's actually a uh a clock that it's a grandfather clock it's a it's a baby grandfather clock it's only like about three feet tall but my my grandfather actually built that for me back in the 80s and this is wow. yes yeah, a handmade clock and I've no one has ever like I've taken it to several clock repair places and stuff over the years and no one's ever seen a, a baby grandfather clock before so I keep it as you know 
memento of my grandfather and and uh it's still working and it's still creepy so you know i gotta keep it <laughs> that's cool yeah i guess that's easier to move around than the large standard size yes it is yes it is fits great in my studio too by the way <laughs> yeah i want to get a cuckoo clock those are pretty cool oh hey man um cuckoo clocks are annoying i just i just want to say that oh yeah i've, I've had them and <laughs> they're, they're oh man they're they're super annoying they're they're great for about i don't know a week and then after that you're like i want to kill this freaking clock i hate it <laughs> oh good that means i can find a used one for cheap then i guess yeah there you go <laughs> well <clears throat> isaac well it's been a while since we have uh uh talked and uh you have been super busy with your podcast has taken off you've written several books since the last time we talked uh you've done a, a dvd or two and man, things are just uh, are, are blowing up for you. And I, I got to say, I've read about three of your books that you've written. And if there's anybody out there who is more versed on the conspiracy theories behind what's going on with our our entertainment media, it, I mean, you are the the authority as far as I'm concerned. I can't imagine anyone being more knowledgeable about this subject than than you. So, you know, good for you for for doing what you're doing and trying to to wake us up to what's going on out there. Wow, geez, thanks. Yeah, that's that's a quite the compliment. I I, I beg to differ. If all you got to do is read through any of my YouTube video comments and you'll see that everyone else out there is a much higher authority and expert on the, <laughs> on the occult. <laughs> no, but, uh, pe- people like to, you know, criticize oh, folks sure. such as myself that go out and talk, talk about these subjects. Cause you know, everyone's got an opinion. So I, I respect that. And, and I think it's honestly, I think it's like more healthy debate. I don't get, too too many people doing actual trolling but i do get a lot of negative comments because i can imagine uh, it seems like as much as i didn't want this entire research project to go into a religious aspect as much as you know i, I even talked about in the first book about how i'm a christian not a good one but i i wanted to separate the religious component from these conspiracies but it ultimately kind of led me down the path that that's kind of the essential linchpin in the quote-unquote illuminati agenda Uh, right or wrong is up to the you know the viewer the listener to understand and and figure out for themselves Uh, because i don't i don't attach judgment to it I, i fully acknowledge that some of the you know christian ideas that I am supposed to subscribe to are are kind of hard to swallow sometimes. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not saying everything's perfect in in my belief system or my worldview, yeah. but it, it is what it is. And ultimately, when you know, after years of researching this, it appears that if I was to pull one ultimate goal or agenda of the Illuminati, it would be to push and instill a culture of Luciferianism and the worship of Lucifer. I've heard you say that before on on interviews because as I was was uh, getting prepared for this show, uh, of course you know any good uh, host is going to do some background research you know and and uh, I kind of felt like I I knew you from before so I I knew what you were about and how you went about doing things but you know like I said you've been busy so I wanted to kind of uh, catch up on what you've been doing and uh, I've heard you say that about the Luciferianism before. Um, so that concept that there would be uh, this this mysterious group, uh, and we're calling them the Illuminati, but just because we don't know what else to call them, is that kind of kind of what I'm getting from you? Mm-hmm, that's right. Yeah, yeah. the uh, the idea of the Illuminati is you know for people that are kind of newer to the subject, we've all heard of the Illuminati at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, what most people, the official definition of what that is, was the secret society from you know Bavaria, Germany, in the late 1700s, right. founded by a, a man named Adam Weishaupt, which ironically or not so ironically is a pseudonym that I chose for my you know alias fake name of Isaac Weishaupt <laughs> or yes. Weishaupt. Uh, I've explained it many times. I'm not of any relation. It was just a 
a name I chose, and in hindsight, terrible choice. But hey, I know, I know, I know. Yes, uh, I wish I hadn't have chosen my moniker as well. But <laughs> it's too late. It's stuck with me, and I have to keep it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get past a certain point, and that's it. So, uh-huh. yeah. It, it, when we talk about the Illuminati today, and I'm not. This isn't exclusive to my research. It's a lot of conspiracy theorists talk about the Illuminati. They're talking about sort of this umbrella group that we're having a difficult time defining and yeah. kind of isolating down to exactly who they are, which is where a lot of people check out because people today in our sort of scientific culture, they, they need data, they need proof, they need facts. Yeah. And when you start researching this, it's hard to say, well, this person here is in the Illuminati and here's why, Be- because we don't really have a clear definition of it. And Mm -hmm. if I was to come up with a definition or maybe an explanation, I would say that the Illuminati is a group of people that are thought leaders. And these thought leaders have power or influence to uh, get the message out to the masses. And I focus strictly on entertainment because that's a subject most of us can relate to and we all seen star wars hence mm-hmm. i wrote a book on the star wars conspiracy yeah we're gonna get to that uh, i got a lot of stuff about that yeah so you know the illuminati when we speak of that it's just this idea that there are people that have a certain belief system that they are not being out in the open about and they are trying to steer humanity down a certain path and that path, according to my research, is into Luciferianism or the worship of Lucifer, the fallen angel. And that's what I was going to say. The fact that that this group is, in your opinion, trying to steer us towards Luciferianism, Luciferianism excuse me, can't talk. Uh, that's kind of, to me, even though you've been talking about this for a while, that is kind of a new concept that I don't think a lot of, of people who think about the Illuminati would, would be, you know, um, I don't think that would be in the forefront of their mind. So this, this concept that you have developed is obviously based on years and years of of study of their practices. I guess that would be a safe assumption. And what's the, like the main thing that you found that, that convinces you of this, or could, could you even narrow it down to one main item? Well, I mean, I suppose there's, I suppose you're right. I suppose there's multiple things and you put them together and it sort of makes a full picture like a puzzle. But the idea that there is a group of people that are steering us down a certain path towards Lucifer, uh, the support for that is these ideas that I, you know, takes you into the stuff they talk about in the Bible, Mm -hmm. which is where I lose a lot of people because they think I'm pushing this real Christian message. And and in reality, I'm not. I'm just saying that we were we were warned about this in the Bible, whether you want to believe in the Bible as the the, the word of God or not. doesn't matter. It was still in there. Right. Right. There was there was this ancient pagan worship of Moloch, which they talk about in the Bible. They talk about sacrificing people to Moloch. Mm-hmm. And there's various talk about people practicing witchcraft, magic, divination, those kinds of things. But if you look at the history of people through these secret societies or the ancient mystery schools, they all learned certain powers of these exact things. And you can find modern day examples if you start dissecting some of the entertainment of the idea of sacrificing to the pagan deities, you find a lot of concepts of practicing magic, whether that's ritual or ceremonial magic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, all of these tie into the same idea of this evolution of consciousness, which ultimately l- lends itself to the destruction of these sort of Abrahamic religions, Christianity in particular. And, and the reason I can I can say that is because if you read it straight from the occultist books like Helena Blavatsky's books or oh, Aleister yeah. Crowley, mm-hmm. they, they talk about very specifically needing to destroy Christianity because they they find it to be this you know great heresy that is actually taking away from the human experience is what they believe. Uh, but when you when you extrapolate that a bit further, you find out that a lot of the attitudes that they have about our experience in this world 
are all ultimately sort of Luciferian ideas of self gratification, uh, living living in the moment. Which uh, not to say there's anything wrong with living in the moment, but uh, it's a lot of this kind of nihilistic mm-hmm. ideas that look, there's nothing after this. We just mm-hmm. die and we go away. The whole of the law is do what thou wilt. Mm, yes, indeed. Yeah. And that, and and that that Aleister Crowley action there that that ties into these ideas that because uh, Aleister Crowley coined the term true will. And we see that that attitude in a lot of people have read the book called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, and that's the same thing that he talks about with the personal legend. And these are all new age concepts. It's, it's this idea that we were put on this in this realm for a purpose, and we need to figure out what that purpose is, and then pursue it at all costs. Uh, a lot of these things tie into this sort of uh, self worship idea because. In the Christian faith, it's supposed to be uh, to do God's will, whereas Aleister Crowley's the exact contradiction of that. It's right. just to do your own will, right? Uh, which you know, again, this is all subjective as to what you want to believe, but it ultimately leads itself down to the path of pride and the worship of Lucifer, who they believe was the true savior of humanity, because Lucifer was the one that that tried to enlighten the human creation and try yeah, to give just them wanted to help the, the path to immortality right? yeah yeah he just wanted to help us out right and god right. was like I, i'm not down for that so the rest is biblical history <laughs> so That's exactly it. let's um let's get into this this latest book that you've written now you you you've got several books out there um and the latest one is this Star Wars conspiracy book. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to say, um, I am a huge Star Wars like geek out nerd fan. Like you know, you know, um, and I could do a whole Star Wars podcast, you know. And and I thought about it, but I'm probably not going to do it. But I digress. So when I got your book about the Star Wars conspiracy. I was like, okay, you know, I, this guy is going to go in and just totally rip apart my Star Wars. And he, you know, he's he's going to, you know, he's he, there's going to be so much shit in there. It, it's just going to rip apart my Star Wars and he's trying to destroy my joy, you know. And I I I will have to admit I was very very wrong. I mean, this is this is a short read. It's only what six chapters. Um, yeah, it's about a hundred, hundred twenty pages. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a very short read, but it's a it's a very good read. And I I was wrong. Um, you're not really ripping apart Star Wars. What you're doing, the way that I understand it, is you're trying to explain how this Illuminati presence influenced the creator of Star Wars and how he went about unknowingly putting these things these beliefs these ideals into his movies and it it didn't really destroy anything that i had as far as my love of star wars and and it was a very uh well researched project and a very uh any star wars fan really should take a minute and read this book because it's 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 very enlightening to it kind of maybe will turn the light on to why a lot of the things happen in Star Wars the way they do because you know there's a lot of plot holes in Star Wars and there's a lot of things that that we don't know why these things are they're just there there's no explanation for them and this kind of maybe will give you a little idea of why things are like that so um how how did you get the idea to write this book well, first off, I'm, I'm happy to hear I didn't destroy Star Wars because yes. that absolutely was not my aim. I'm also <laughs> a fan. I'm not, you know, a huge Star Wars fan, but I, I've always enjoyed the films, and I typically like. I'm at the level where if it's a new movie, I'll go to the theater and see it. That's about as far as I take it. Okay. Well, we can uh, so, still be yeah, friends. I, I seek I seek not to destroy this universe of Star Wars, <laughs> but it just started out. It's like everything else. I. I start by writing an article, and before I know it, like the article is way too long to publish on the website. 
uh, and then it starts to hit me. I think, ah, crap. All right. Well, let me, <laughs> let me put an outline on this and, mm-hmm. and try to, you know, it's hard to kind of coalesce digestible chunks of this material. So it just, it takes a while to figure out the flow of it, I should say. Yeah. Uh, so w- once I found out I had more, I'd found more in my research than what constituted a single article. That's when I, like most things I say, okay, well, I guess I got to make this like an entire book. Uh, but but you're right. I, I, I think the ideas here are not to say, hey, you should never watch Star Wars. It's such a terrible thing. But it's more to say or demonstrate that some of the, you know, George Lucas and Gary Kurtz that wrote this story, perhaps they were under some kind of Luciferian or dark energy because they were surrounded, you know, through – you know, one, two, three, up to six degrees of separation from sort of dark energies. If you look at the history of how this thing got put together, so I just try to like pull that out, give some actual citations of where I found this information, so people can look into it for themselves and and, and see that a lot of these ideas that we find in Star Wars are exactly the occult agenda of what the Illuminati are trying to do. And it's very kind of uh, eye-opening and scary at the same time to see just how close George Lucas was to all this occult, all these occult teachings. Right, and and that's you know it all starts out as I explained in the book at the uh, Altamont Music Festival, Hang which on. was. Sorry, airplanes. That's okay. um, uh, so. It, uh, so it all starts out when George Lucas was the cameraman at the Altamont Film Festival, or I'm sorry, not Film Festival, the uh, Music Festival. Uh, and I confirmed this by watching the Rolling Stones Gimme Shelter documentary. Uh, but there was only one shot that was kept from George Lucas, and that was a shot of people coming up over the hillside during a full moon at the end of the concert, which which it ended in chaos due to the uh, the the death, the murder of a, a man named Meredith Hunter, I believe was his last name, uh, because the Hells Angels were the security team right. and the Rolling Stones were, were playing on stage. They were actually playing Sympathy for the Devil when things started getting out of hand. What a coincidence. And, yeah, what a coincidence, right? And, and, and in the book I go into like, you know – that's that's kind of a one interesting aspect of it, but the, the other interesting aspects are the ideas that Mick Jagger was actually connected into these occult uh, studies with with you a man know, named Kenneth Anger. I was surprised who, to learn that who who was tied to Aleister Crowley. You know, it's it's kind of the the same. It's almost the same story, and every everything I put together, it, it always ties into Aleister Crowley. Mm-hmm. It ties into these occult ideas. Uh, it, you know, because Mick Jagger was supposed to be in a film called Lucifer Rising and supposed to play the role of Lucifer, but this Altamont music festival and, and the darkness that he saw when the murder happened was uh, kind of what got him to back away from the occult. Uh, but anyways, my argument was that, look, there was for sure some kind of dark energy there, evil spirit, whatever you want to call it. There was some kind of dark energy in the air, and that's, that's uh, supported by what, Mick Jagger said at the concert when he said that there was some funny things happening when they played Sympathy for the Devil and then on the very next song was when the uh, Meredith Hunter got murdered by the Hells Angel security team so to me it seems like well here's a guy who's somewhat knowledgeable on the occult I mean he was hanging out with Kenneth Anger who was a, a heavy duty occultist yeah. and he said oh wow there's something really bad happening here then the murder happens so my argument is maybe george lucas was somewhat possessed by this spirit and that's what drove him and gary kurtz to perhaps write a tale such as this where they they push a certain attitude which is called the force and it's actually right. an ancient sort of pagan belief system how how do you how do you get a pagan belief system tied into the force so if if you look at the the idea of the force the idea of the force is that uh, there's a belief in a global consciousness mm-hmm. uh, this is 
this is sort of a cult idea is tied in with the uh, perennial philosophy that Aldous Huxley talked about. Uh, but it's this ideas of these hidden energy fields and that God is actually just an energy field and not an actual, uh, you know, man in the cloud, so to speak, or Jesus Christ. Right. And they, they believe that you can either sort of connect into this hidden energy or disconnect from the hidden energy. And then on top of that, to, you know, take that further, they believe that the force has a light side and a dark side. Mm-hmm. And what you'll find out is that it doesn't really matter which side of the force you connect to. It's connecting to God, to this cosmic energy. Uh, it's it's uh, Obi-Wan says it's an energy field created by all living things. And, and in the story, it's it's quite obvious that it's it's this energy that surrounds all of us. But it, this this whole idea of a cosmic consciousness is supported by sort of new age occultists uh, for for years for for many many decades mm-hmm. so the the idea that, you know <clears throat> what we see and if so they say it's a a land long ago and, and far away suggesting it's you know historical truth which is kind of what some of these occultists believe in they believe in atlantis lemuria they believe in these ancient cultures that right. they claim were were superior to ours and they had a, a more advanced technology some of them even claim like on ancient aliens they claim that they were given this special enlightenment by the alien gods mm-hmm. uh, they also believe in these sort of superhuman uh, abilities that we used to have back then of like levitation mind control uh, telekinesis and all of these things are, are what you see the powers of the force bestowing upon its practitioner right well, what's interesting about all that is, you know, these are just, again, these New Age occultist ideas that were presented by Helena Blavatsky, and she supposedly channeled all this knowledge from these disembodied spirits, which, again, we can argue are demonic influences of this fallen angel Lucifer. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if one of the things that, that you talk about in the book is that you you are saying how the st- the whole Star Wars story is kind of trying to drive us away from religion as a whole is is or am I uh, and, and, No, that's right. Okay. So my my question to you on this is if you're saying that what Lucas George Lucas is telling us in this phenomenal tale that he's telling this this that has so many huge chapters in basically creating this universe and this religion uh if he's trying to steer us away from religion as a whole because of his illuminati influence and the illuminatis are trying to steer us towards luciferianism isn't luciferianism a religion they don't believe it to be an, uh, an, a religion, so to speak, as as we talk about our organized religions. They okay. they think it to be just the plain out truth, and that all organized religions are deceptions. And that's why you see this kind of attitude in in, in many forms of science fiction, because you'll notice in the world of science fiction, they generally show us. You know, it's assumed it's in the future, or it will directly tell us it's in the future. Mm-hmm. And they always show us a world that's devoid of religion, and it shows these these human beings with superpowers, whether they're evolved uh, mutants like the X Men, or like Deadpool, or, or or stuff like that. It's it's ideas right. of evolution or evolving mankind into something better or more powerful. Uh, and in Arthur C. Clarke's novels for the 2001 A Space Odyssey and the sequels, you you find out in the – I believe there was four, four books. You find out through the progression of the books that in the future we abandon religion entirely because these these sort of alien interdimensional spirits come and make contact with us and they enlighten us into their ways – and it ultimately leaves you down the path of transhumanism and becoming a sort of digitized consciousness. These in, in the book, they, they talk about it being like a, a digital uh, sort of data form of light and, and, and people live for immortality. 
just screaming across the universe as actual data. I mean, it's a very, it's a very strange concept, but when you look at uh, recent films like Get Out or Selfless with that, you know, the Ryan Reynolds film, they're mm-hmm. already showing us the ideas of mind and consciousness transfer. You see it in Avatar. That's probably the most popular one. That, that's a good example. It's yeah. this idea of transferring the mind so that basically that in and of itself destroys a lot of religious attitudes. If you can, if you can pull someone's consciousness out and uh, transfer it, then that, that begs many questions of uh, what the purpose of our existence is here on Earth. All right. There goes my clock again. It's, dun, it's, dun, dun. Yeah, it's like, uh, for lack of a better term, it's like ripping our soul out of our body and putting it in someone else's. Yeah, and, and I, I, I don't say I don't believe in it. I don't subscribe to that. Yeah. I don't want that for humanity. Uh, you know, when you look at these occultists like Aleister Crowley, they they talk about this new age being a time of magical expression. And and mm-hmm. like I said before, Crowley specifically wanted to get rid of religious uh, attitudes, Christianity in particular. But that what they want is to evolve mankind into something else, into something ma- and made, because they think Lucifer or the Prometheus, whatever you want to call this sort mm-hmm. of entity, is trying to help us on our journey. And you can see this in Childhood's End, that Arthur C. Clarke novel turned into a uh, TV uh, movie series on sci-fi. These these aliens, they're trying to t- turn us into something else. And it's not so ironic that this something else is something you see in every comic book film, sci-fi film, Star Wars. It's always this idea that, look, there's something better for us. And, and we're supposed to want to reach out to that and, and become that. Uh, but I'm just presenting the argument of, hey, are we sure we really want that? Yeah. And I know you do some stuff on transhumanism, too. And, and maybe in a in a future appearance on the show, we can talk about transhumanism. But um, as far as guiding us towards this one particular way, this worldview, one worldview that the Illuminati want us to have... Uh, I guess it's it's your um, uh, opinion that the Star Wars universe and the telling of all these tales is George Lucas's contribution to that to that goal. Yes, that's that, that's exactly it. And I don't know because if you look at George Lucas's bio, he claims to be a you know from what I can tell, I don't know how old if he still subscribes to this, I should say, but he talks about being a, a blend of uh, Methodist Christian and uh, Buddhism, which you know Buddhism isn't necessarily a religion, it's more of a belief system. Right. Uh, and 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 that's and I've studied some of the Buddhism uh, lines of thoughts and you know they they've got some good things in there to to pull out, but I don't know for certain. I haven't heard the question asked of him in recent years, but to me it seems like this is indeed his sort of true will that Lucifer may have given to him, whether he was aware of it or not, because he he said back in the uh, 70s when he was talking about Star Wars, he said he wanted to awaken a certain kind of spirituality with the Force. You know, and I don't okay. see if he if he is a, a Methodist Christian. I don't see any Christian themes in the film. Um, so. uh, no, I don't. I don't see any Christian themes in the film either. Um, it's a good point. I mean, they show they show a good guy, Luke Skywalker, a bad guy, Darth Vader. But it's curious because you, by the time you watch Episode Three, uh, you you find out that hey, maybe maybe Darth Vader wasn't such a bad guy. Maybe Anakin was just trying to protect the people that he loves which we can all identify with and i'm sure many of us would do things that we would typically consider quote-unquote evil yeah. or, or bad or not right to save the ones that we love in our family and yeah. i mean which we, comes we can't sympathize for that yeah and that that comes into the popular um uh portrayal these days of what's known as the dark hero 
where mm-hmm. yeah the dark hero is is again a, a reference to lucifer the it's this idea that someone who typically on the surface you would think is evil turns out they're just uh they're just a human and they're trying to do their best yeah and the though the way that they go about doing things is anti-establishment so to speak yeah mm-hmm. yeah they want to they want to make us sympathize for the dark hero or the mm-hmm. anti-hero, which is, is what happens at episode three. When, exactly. Uh, in the book, I talked about how when the people were coming out of the movie theaters, they were they were confused about what they had just saw mm-hmm. because for years, you know, if you grew up in the 70s and 80s before the episodes one, two, and three came out, right. Darth Vader was always just a real bad guy. But then yeah. by episode three, the people were confused like, wait a minute, I – I thought he was this bad guy and now I don't really feel that way anymore. And, yeah, exactly. And, and that's the exact point of the whole star Wars tale is to make people understand that there's not such a thing as good and evil. There's, there just is. Well, Darth Vader really, in my opinion, wasn't, I mean, he's been looked at as like the ultimate villain, the ultimate bad guy for decades, but really in the movies, if you look at it and you study it, such as you and obviously you've studied it more than I have, but he's really nothing more than just the henchman. He's he's you know the a stoolie for the emperor. The real bad guy in the the Star Wars universe has always been Palpatine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why you know Darth Vader uh, saves Luke Skywalker and, and takes the Emperor out exactly because he ultimately is he he was he was sort of the first one to make contact with the dark side of the force and come back mm-hmm. to you know the good side or whatever you want to call it uh, so that's that's the idea the whole story is about it's not really about luke skywalker it's about it's about anakin peering into the abyss and making contact with the dark side and coming back to say hey just because you uh, try something evil out doesn't mean that you're evil so to speak it's a good point. That's a very good point. And speaking of, of good and evil, you make a reference in this book to, uh, a, I'm going to try to re- remember this, uh, the hero's journey mm-hmm. and how there has to be certain elements of the hero's journey. And you go on to describe that, how that is done in Star Wars. So elaborate on that for people who haven't read your book. Sure. And and you can find a lot of studies of this online i i don't profess to be the one that came up with this but uh, a man named joseph campbell wrote this uh, hero's journey idea it's um it's an idea supported by carl Jung's archetypes uh also called the seeds of consciousness or primordial images it's it's this idea that there are certain things that our subconscious can connect into sort of archetypal events or such as uh, birth, death, separation from parents, or as in the Star Wars, the uh, reconciliation of opposites. Mm-hmm. But it's this idea that we all are familiar on some level with certain characters, and and this is how they they market and do commercials. You know, they they've only got maybe thirty seconds to get a whole story across of why you need to buy a product, and right. and they they do very well at making it crystal clear who who the characters are right away um it's this idea that we see in star wars when we see these these certain archetypes of people like the initiate who is luke skywalker you have the the the, the sage or the wise old man who's obi-wan kenobi Mm -hmm. darth vader is sort of the satanic devil and then you've also got like the rebel archetype like han solo yeah Uh, but all these things all these things ironically kind of support a lot of the uh, the themes of symbolism and the powers of symbols. It's, it's this idea that they can present to us a certain symbol uh, which has its own message attached to it right into our subconscious and we're not really sure why they're doing it or what the effects are. But there is something, sort of an intangible consciousness that connects us into this. And this idea of the hero's journey is... Uh, uh, sort of an idea of an initiate going through the cycle that we can all relate to of, uh, you know, 
responding to a calling, going into a dark place and overcoming your uh, fears of that place and coming back as a new evolved being enlightened in what, what Joseph Campbell calls the boons. Uh, it's, it's coming back with a new knowledge and awareness of yourself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to know thyself and, and it requires you to uh, sort of go into a dark place, which is exactly what Anakin does. He, right. Uh, and and the title of Darth is related to the Kabbalah tree of life with the the Dayoth. The Dayoth, it's a hidden, yeah. the the Dayoth, a hidden node, because right. uh, Dayoth means knowledge. So Anakin taps into this knowledge and is able to come back with the boons, and he's an evolved being that's a new breed, so to speak, that's able to utilize the the light and dark side of the force and prove that there there can be a balance to be struck between the two and the the day off isn't that referring to the the tree of life and like a a, a hidden um path that one can take to get that's to right. all this knowledge that's right a lot of a lot of occultists subscribe to this idea of mm -hmm. the the cabalistic tree of life and it's it's basically an idea that God created our world through emanations of thought, and each of these thoughts is represented by a sephirot or a node. A node. And you can tr you can sort of learn going up this tree of life from the the earthly realm, and learn and master each node, uh, and further enlightening yourself the whole way up till you get to the top, which is the kether, which is the uh, the heaven realm. And then once you reach that, you become sort of like a god in, in your own right an enlightened well, being an enlightened being yeah. and and the one there's a shortcut through the center called uh, the the dayoth the hidden sephirot and this is uh, a place that Aleister Crowley even warned about crossing it because he he claimed that there was a a guardian a demonic guardian of this dayoth called Corone Zone and if you weren't prepared to confront Corone Zone you would go insane which oh. is what what uh people people claim uh various folks have tried to do this and actually gone insane uh, I think like Frederick Nietzsche because in his last days he was losing his marbles he was the, the founder <laughs> yeah. of like nihilism right uh, some claim that he did that but uh, but if you could go hmm. through the abyss and come out the other side you can sort of be a god in your own right so do you think that uh, Crowley went through this or did he avoid it yeah he, he said he did so um you know he he's he's followed by many people mm -hmm. because he's he's he was kind of instrumental in ushering many new ideas yeah uh, he was the one that made contact with like the first gray alien supposedly lamb uh, and and if you look at if you google search for the mm -hmm. crowley's lamb you'll see that he looks exactly like a gray alien wow he was responsible for uh writing the a series of ritual magic called the Babylon workings and the Babylon workings were actually performed by Jack Parsons, who was again, like a predecessor to the, uh, the founding of NASA along yeah. with L. Ron mm -hmm. Hubbard, founder of the church of Scientology. Yeah. They, they did some freaky shit together. That's right. And, and, and they ripped a hole in the, in the, uh, supposedly in, in the, they pierced the veil, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. That's what pulled the Roswell alien craft through right. because they was, forgot they to close the open. portal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, for 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 those people who don't know about L. Ron Hubbard and some of the freaky shit that he did, you need to do some research, man. Because that is that dude is just off the charts weird. Yeah, it's wild. It's definitely interesting, <laughs> and and that and the fact that Star Wars takes place in outer space isn't coincidental either, because uh, L. Ron Hubbard he was a science fiction writer right. before he started the Church of Scientology, and he he was uh, quoted as saying that science fiction had a mission, and that mission was to get man out to the stars, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of these people like like uh, Werner von Braun, the the the, uh, the Nazi scientist we brought yeah. over. Inventor he, of the Saturn a, free rocket. That's right. He he was a follower of uh, Konstantin Soykovsky, who was actually the first ancient alien astronaut that, that talked about aliens being our true gods. That's an interesting 
thought there because I never knew that about uh, Von Braun. I never, I, I've never really done. You know, I'm I'm an amateur uh, Nazi um, expert. <laughs> that, that's right. And, yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> I've uh, I, I've never really done a whole lot of uh, looking into Von Braun because he wasn't one of the people who really like super interested me as much as Hitler and, and Himmler did. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. that that's very interesting to hear you say that he had some occultist occultism in his background, some occultist beliefs. And I'm going to, now I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to do some research on Von Braun. Yeah, he was, he was heavy into science fiction and was always obsessed with going to the moon, but he was also obsessed with the, the first iteration of the ancient astronaut theory with, like I said, a man named uh, Konstantin Soykovsky. Okay. It was the one that came came up with this many years before uh, Giorgio Tsoukalos talked about it. <laughs> I have <laughs> I have met Giorgio Tsoukalos. Oh, how was it? You know, one would think that he would be like some sort of like just really weird dude that's out in left field somewhere, but he is a very intelligent, well-spoken, well-articulated individual. And I know he makes his his living off of this ancient aliens thing, but Mm -hmm. there's more to him than just that. And I, I was very surprised at how, um, this is just one aspect of his life, but it's, it's a big part of his life, obviously. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I give the man props for, uh, he was on Joe Rogan several years ago and I mean, Joe Rogan's podcasts are three, four hours long and and Joe Rogan's a very smart man himself. I don't say Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying I subscribe to everything he believes in, but uh, the guy knows a lot about a lot of stuff. So the fact that he was able to go on Joe Rogan and, and, and kind of hold his own for so long, that's – yeah, the guy's definitely intelligent. I, even though I kind of trash on the ancient aliens guys in, in my Star Wars book, I, I, I still believe that – you know, most of them are pretty open-minded guys, and at least you know, at least they're researching these ideas instead of just, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know what would be considered a waste of time nowadays. But at least they're entertaining thoughts that are a little more interesting than most. Well, the 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 whole ancient alien or ancient astronaut theory thing is something that I have been into since well before it became popular on, on TV. And, um, I'm, I'm a Sitchinite and I've been reading, I've read all of Zechariah Sitchin stuff and I've been into Sitchin for a long time now. And the stuff that they're talking about is not news to me. Let me put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's, let's get back to your star Wars book here for a second. Cause we're, we got about, uh, little over 10 minutes left and i want to try to get in as much on this star wars thing as we can so getting back to the hero's journey the hero is considered in the star wars universe to be luke skywalker the villain Mm -hmm. is darth vader and the wise old learned man who's passing his knowledge on to our hero is obi-wan correct yes okay so with this hero's journey, you have these three principal characters who are all intertwined and they all connect with each other. Do you think that when Lucas was writing these characters, do you think that he specifically knew that he was emulating the hero's journey and intentionally put this into the films or is this just another example of this subliminal effect that this evil presence that he was exposed to back in Altamont was, you know, was, was, is this something that was, that was affecting him? You know, he didn't know. I think that he, he actually played it off because some people have asked him about this and he played it off like it didn't have much like he was familiar with the concept, but didn't really study it. But I I don't know about that. I kind of believe, personally that he was well aware of this and he was actually pretty uh pretty smart to uh implement it in a film because i you know a lot a lot of people were doing this at the time Mm -hmm. but uh since then you can you can watch films and see this exact cycle uh, because i think people are now emulating george lucas uh, yeah and what started me down this path of studying star wars 
was uh, an idea I actually heard from from Freeman Fly, where he was talking about, and I'm not going to try to quote him, or I'll try my best to paraphrase, but it was something okay. to the effect of how how strange and curious it is that we're all so well connected to this Star Wars tale as if it's there's something a little bit, I don't know, more important or more more tangible that we can connect to in this in these tales than most others because i mean there's lots of science fiction uh movies and and stories why is this the one it's it's not particularly different it's just able to tap into something that we're all familiar with because of this idea of the hero's journey and the archetypes uh you know and and archetype events such as the the death of the parents which is a a concept we go into in the book with Mm -hmm. how, how curious it is that in lots of disney tales the parents are either absent, cruel, evil, or dead completely. And then in the Star Wars films, which uh, you know everyone knows, Disney acquired the Star Wars mm-hmm. franchise a few years ago. Yep. Uh, it just so happens that in almost all the Star Wars movies, we 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 see this sort of traumatic event where the parents are either dying in the arms of their children or the children kill their parents, you know, themselves. Very interesting. And that just kind of, as you were talking about that, that just made me put two and two together with the um, episode seven, um, The Force Awakens. You see our hero, Ray, who is parentless, mm-hmm. which right. fits then, right in with that Disney theme. Right. And then, um, you know, what happens to Han Solo in there, it, it also plays into that as well Mm -hmm. the child kills the parent yeah that's right and kylo ren kills him it's uh he he's kind of faced with the decision of doing it or not and he obviously goes for it yeah that's yeah i i I wonder if disney because we, we there's so many conspiracies about disney oh god I wonder if they were motivated to purchase the Star Wars franchise because they understood the ability for the Star Wars films to tap into the subconscious through this hero's journey or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, as well as the the, uh, the the killing of the parents theme that is in all of the films, which but, I'm sure and confident it will be in the next one as well. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad that you, you brought that up because that's kind of how I wanted to end things was – now that Lucas doesn't have control over the Star Wars universe anymore and it's squarely in the hands of Disney, what do you think is going to happen with this path that Lucas has been leading us down? Is Do you think that, and I think you, you kind of just answered this, but what I was going to ask you was do you think that Disney even knows, which they probably do, you know, are they going to continue or, or on Lucas's path or are they going to lead us somewhere different are they going to take it and lead us to where they want us to go well they're definitely going to take us down their own path i think george lucas wasn't quite overt enough with it and they're going to take us down that path of uh, alien beings being our our creators uh, more and more of this concept of balancing the force which is, is kind of a it's kind of a misnomer because when people think of balancing the force, they think, oh, that means, you know, the good the good guys destroying the the dark side of the force. But that's that's not really true. You can't really you can't really do that because if you want something to be in balance, I mean, that's the term they use. Yeah, you got to have parts equal magnitude on both sides. So exactly. You would, to have a force in balance, you need equal parts light, equal parts equal tar- dark. Tar- yep. So exactly. destroying the dark would actually make it imbalance. So what are they exactly. talking about? They're they're talking about balancing it out meaning getting rid of the two extremes completely and just saying hey there's no such thing as good or bad right or wrong there just is and this this just is is connecting to this global consciousness and this Mm -hmm. sort of false god that they've created well i've i've got a whole bunch of star wars theories myself and one of mine is about the jedi council and anakin Specifically speaking, uh, in terms of uh, the Liam Neeson character, Qui-Gon, and he was saying how he suspected Anakin was the one that was going to bring balance to the Force. He was the chosen one. Mm -hmm. And everybody assumed that that was 
well, the chosen one is that's the one that's going to bring balance to the force and he's going to make it everything all right and everything's going to be good. But what if the chosen one was just supposed to be the person who gives birth to or brings about the creation of the balance of the force, which would be Luke. And now you have Luke who is not a uh, classically trained Jedi. He has both elements of light and dark in him and he is going to destroy the Jedi as we know it and when I say destroy I don't mean kill everybody I mean he's going to reform it and you're going to have just a group of people who are neither Sith nor Jedi but they're wielders of the force because they have light and dark within them and there's your balance That's I think that's dead on I think that Luke is equivalent to the star child or the moon child, which is evident in Crowley's writings, mm-hmm. as well as various films, Rosemary's Baby, Prometheus, Aliens, the list goes on and on. But he's this sort of new beginning, and he is the one that's going to bring balance, and he is the one that's going to create this sort of new world order in the Jedi Council, which yep. is, like you said, I, I agree. I think ultimately they're going to make this this uh, Jedi Council bring the, the Sith Lords into the fold and just say, look, we're all one being here. Uh, and I imagine the films are going to show like a struggle of that sort of merging together, but we'll see. I, I right. mean, yeah. in the, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the episode seven is called the force awakens. Episode yeah. eight is called the last Jedi. So the right. force awakens the last Jedi, meaning the Jedi knighthood will be no longer. So yep. yeah, that's I'm what right it looks with to. you, man. I think yep. they're, they're making the one world order, so to speak, in the in mm-hmm. the Star Wars universe. Yep, that's that's kind of where I was headed with that. So yeah, we're right on par with that. So have have you ever done any um, research into the Star Trek universe? I have not. I never was a fan. I'm not saying yeah. that that's a bad series. I just never watched yeah. it. So I don't. I'd have it. It would take. Uh, it's it's kind of like the Harry Potter series. Oh, I God. know there's something there. I just don't. I just haven't had an interest or the time to I hear go you. into yeah. the full research. Not not a Harry Potter fan. Never have seen any of the movies and really don't care to here. And, yeah, uh, that's kind of where I'm at with. Yeah. I, I wish you know if, if if I didn't have a day job and time wasn't a factor, I would yeah. plow through. The, You're you know, independently six, seven, wealthy, and, sure. Yeah, the, yeah. I've got <laughs> I've got a good friend who uh, is a big Star Trek fan, and he swears up and down that the Star Trek, the motion picture that came out right after star Wars did, he swears to God on a stack of Bibles that it's nothing but a two hour long movie. It was a reference to an allegory of sex and the whole sexual right. act. And he actually sat down with me and made me watch it with him as he narrated this whole thing. And after the movie was over with, I was like, Holy shit, I think he's on to something. <laughs> <laughs> the subtraction there. Maybe yeah. we should do a YouTube video on it. That's what I told him. I said, man, I will produce it. I've got all of the qu- equipment that we need to do this thing. We should do it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, it man, it has been, we're running out of time. It has been really great talking to you. We could do uh, two or three hours on this whole Star Wars conspiracy thing. And uh, if, if, those of you who are listening to this podcast, if you're whether you're a Star Wars fan or not, really shouldn't matter. You really should pick this book up because it's it, not only is it a really good read, but it's a quick read and it's not written uh, over your head. It's a very well written book, and anybody can can pick this up and understand the concepts that's being talked about that uh, Isaac is is putting forth, but. If you're a Star Wars fan, you definitely need to pick this up because it will open your eyes to a lot of things and and, and why maybe these things are happening within the Star Wars universe. Um, Isaac, um, how if, if, if I've got people out here who want to pick up your books or who want to get in touch with you, how can they go about doing this? Well, you know, obviously, depending on when they're listening to this, uh, May 4th through the 8th of 2017, you can go to Amazon.com and find me on there, Isaac Weishop. And the book is called The Star Wars Conspiracy, and it's actually free to download on Kindle for those days only. It's just a temporary one-time promotion. Okay. Uh, but if you're listening to the show beyond that, which I'm guessing you know some people will be, 
Uh, you can go to IlluminatiWatcher.com. I've got a shop tab, and on there you can find links to, you know, I've got uh, self-narrated audio books on Audible of almost everything I've written. I've got signed paperbacks you can buy. I've got discounted packages. Or you can just go to Amazon if you're more comfortable buying stuff through them. Uh, you can do that. Or, uh, like I said, audible.com. And if, if they go to IlluminatiWatcher.com, there's a free email sign-up. I want them to sign up for that because that will start sending them archived articles. And, and you'll you'll start putting all this stuff together once you start reading more and more about how this is all connected with everything. So IlluminatiWatcher.com, that's the website address. And you can find him by looking up Isaac Weishaupt on Amazon. And Weishaupt is W-E-I-S-H-A-U-P as in Papa T, correct? That's it. Yeah, I spelled it right on the first go around. <laughs> uh, find him on Twitter, at Illuminati Eyes on Twitter. Um, Facebook, what's your Facebook page? I know you got one. I've got a, a Illuminati Watcher Facebook page, and then I've got the Isaac Weishaupt personal sort of profile page. Ah, oh, okay. So you just type in Isaac Weishaupt or Illuminati Watcher on Facebook, and you can find him there. Uh, man, it's been such a – the hour has gone by so quickly. It's been really great talking to you. I feel that you and I are like kindred. You know? Yeah, man, for sure. Um, I, I think we could go on and riff on this for hours and hours. Oh, yes, because, you know, I'm a conspiracy theorist when it comes to things with uh, the Nazis and my whole chemtrail thing, and then you've got your whole entertainment spin on everything. I feel like we're brothers from another mother, man. We'd, too bad. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's too bad we're not closer together because I would enjoy hanging out with you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so, man, and for sure. I'm going to have you back on my uh, my podcast. Yes. Uh, you know, for the listeners, it was he, uh, Sam Man was on Conspiracy Theories and Unpopular Culture, which is my podcast. And he talked about the the Nazis, and that was actually one of the most popular shows I've done. So Woo-hoo. kudos. Yeah, thank you. Thank. You. <laughs> is that what got you kind of investigating the Nazis? Well, yeah. I mean, I've always yes. been interested in it. I've, I'm an I influencer. Done any yes. Single projects on it because again, it's it's sort of like the Harry Potter Star Trek idea. Like, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. Just so much. There it's, is. There is. And I and I don't like presenting research unless I've done all of the research, and I, I just don't have the time. <laughs> I, you've got. You need to become independently wealthy, man. You need to start selling more oh, books. Man, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. I want to be your manager. That's all I got to say. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Everybody, this has been Isaac Weishaupt, the Illuminati Watcher. If you want to get in touch with him, just uh, go to IlluminatiWatcher.com, or you can go to his Facebook page. You can just type in Illuminati Watcher on a Facebook uh, search. Um, get in touch with him. Read his stuff, uh, buy some of his books. is is really interesting stuff. If you're whole, new to the whole world of entertainment conspiracy theories, you need to pick up a grand unified conspiracy theory, which kind of gives a big overview of everything this gentleman talks about, and it's a really good read. And uh, Isaac, thank you once again for being on Parareality Radio, and I am going to have you back on this show soon because there's so much more we need to talk about. Most definitely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, We're going to say goodbye to Isaac, and uh, I'm going to wind up the show here in just a minute. Once again, thanks so much for being on the show, Isaac. Thanks. You are listening to the award-winning Parareality Radio, providing you the best in paranormal radio since 2004. Join me, Sandman, and my roster of special guests, experts, and experiencers of the paranormal as we explore the realms of the known and the unknown. New episodes can be heard the first Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Listen online at parareality.com. Turn on, tune in, and find out. Man, that was a very interesting interview with a very interesting guy, the Illuminati watcher, Isaac Weishaupt. If you've never checked out any of his stuff, you need to go to his website, IlluminatiWatcher.com, and uh, check out his his website there. And also, uh, download some of his books. Just go to Amazon, type in Isaac Weishaupt, and type in some of his books, or you can just order them off of his Illuminati Watcher website. 
Well, everybody, that about does it for this edition of Parareality Radio. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's interview with Isaac Weishaupt, the Illuminati Watcher. Let me know what you thought about it by sending me an email to sandman at parareality.com. That's sandman at parareality.com. Uh, don't forget to visit parareality.com, by the way, to uh, not only listen to this episode of Parareality Radio, but also uh, check out all the archives that I've got going on. I've got uh, archives of the show in all of its different forms. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I've been on a few different uh, websites and and, uh, ways of podcasting. I've done um, Live 365 for a few years. I've got all my archives from there. Uh, Of course, you got my archives from here on Spreaker. That's where you can listen to the first interview that I did with Isaac Weishaupt. And uh, I've also done terrestrial radio with a local radio station here in the Nashville area, WRFN Radio Free Nashville. And I've got most of my archives from there, not all of them, but you can hear all of that on parareality.com by clicking on the archives tab. Um, you can also check out the uh, extras tab there on Parareality Radio or parareality.com, damn it. And you can uh, join the official Parareality Radio forum, free to join, by the way. You can shop in the official Parareality Radio store, and you can even watch some show videos and other stuff like that. I did a very, very brief, uh, poorly done uh, web TV series. Um, Man, that didn't work out too well. Um, I'm supposedly still owe, uh, I think it's like three or four episodes on the quote-unquote contract. Um, I'm going to have to fulfill those in some shape, form, or fashion. I don't know how. It's been a few years, and no one's ever said, hey, you got to finish this up. So I don't know. We'll see. But uh, you can watch some episodes from there. Uh, there's all kind of other stuff, too. Uh, don't forget to look me up on Facebook. That's Sandman.Parareality on Facebook. Or you can just type in a Facebook search for Parareality Radio. Uh, you can also listen to the show on Facebook as well. And uh, you can also find out more about what's going on in the in the world of Parareality Radio. Um, check out what uh, some of my, my uh, ramblings and stuff like that there on Facebook. And, of course, I am on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at Para Real Radio. That's at Para Real Radio, and I'm always tweeting out something to do with the show. I tweet out show announcements, like special guests, topics, uh, stuff of that nature. So be sure to follow me on Twitter at Para Real Radio. So those are all the different kind of ways you can get in touch with me uh, here at Para Reality Radio. Of course, I do still have the studio line up and running. If you want to call and leave a message, you can call anytime, 24-7-365. The number is 615-692-1170. That number to call, once again, is area code 615, then dial 692-1170. You can leave me a message about anything that you want to, uh, about this show, about a topic for another show, maybe have an idea for a topic for another show. Um guest you would like to see appear on the show or uh, just anything in general that you want to leave me feel free to leave a message just by leaving me the message though you're giving me permission to play your comment back on the air so um, if you don't want it played back you need to tell me as you leave your message and like I always say you never know I'm always in the studio working on something so you may catch me on the studio I just may actually answer the phone so you never know so uh, you can try if you want to get in touch with me there on the studio line Everybody, Parareality Radio will return next Friday, May the 12th, 2017, with another episode of Coal Shack, The Night Stalker. That's on the Scared to Death version of Parareality Radio. If you've been listening to the first two episodes, Carl has gotten himself in a predicament, and we're going to find out what is going on, how he's going to get himself out of this. I don't know. You'll just have to listen to next week's edition of Scared to Death presented by Parareality Radio. So make sure you turn on, tune in, and find out. Everybody, I hope that this radio program opens your mind up to new ways of thinking, expands your consciousness, and produces a change in the way you see the world. If you wish to change, you must lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. 
only then will you see the true power of the universe. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everybody. And I will see you again on the first Friday of June with another edition of Parareality Radio. Good night and take care, everybody.